Welcome everyone to uh, this week's broadcast of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host, Keith Alperin. I'm Will Burnick. Mm -hmm. And today our topic is the filmmaker and autism with our guest, Daniel Walker. But before we begin with uh, Daniel, Will, what's with your t-shirt? We can't see what it is today. Uh, this is my Scott Weider shirt. I'm I'm marching. I'm it's Pride Month, and tomorrow I'm, I'm marching in the Pride Parade for Scott Weider. Excellent. Thank you very much, Will. Um, would you now like to uh, introduce our guest? I'd love to. Daniel, tell us about your background in, in the filmmaking. Um, I mean, I've been working in essentially video and video production for a between eight to twelve years, depending upon how you want to. Uh, how you want to look at it, mostly in kind of a corporate video sense, but working on um, a variety of, say, like short films and um, uh, features uh, as well. Tell us about your background in the autism community. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say that I have a, an extensive background um, there. I and several of my close friends um, are diagnosed um, on the spectrum, however, which is kind of what uh, has brought us to making this project. Tell us about your current project in filmmaking. So what we're currently working on is essentially a documentary that is looking at kind of the larger state of employment um, and more likely under and unemployment among uh, individuals on the spectrum um, across the board. Um, the issues uh, behind it, um, the experiences that people have had trying to find jobs uh, and trying to keep jobs, as well as individuals trying to help uh, people find jobs and trying to change systems that makes it easier for people to find uh, meaningful full-time employment. Would you say that, um, going a little uh, to a bit of a side direction here, would you say that being on the autism spectrum, being diagnosed has influenced the way you approach filmmaking at all? Um, in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um no i mean in a lot of ways i think that things are a lot harder um because a lot of this requires making a lot of connections and mm -hmm. consistently reaching out and maintaining kind of uh social contact which can be very draining as well mm -hmm. as the fact that um I'm finding that a lot of material that I would hope to be doing with help uh, is not, um, the help is not necessarily there. Could you go into a little bit more about that? What sort of help um, have you been seeking? Is it financial? Is it people uh, not willing to cooperate or not being able to? Tell us more about that. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of uh, everything there, but I mean, it's it's just in terms of like, there's a lot of um, material that I'm hoping that I don't have to do in terms of say, like filling out a lot of forms and applying for for grants, et cetera, that I think that there are people um, better than I am to do that and um, being able to find people um, to do that and to help with that has been very hard. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously, there's the issue of finances also. Um, that's one of the issues that we're currently running into in terms of trying to finish the project. Oh, understood. Again, it's difficult to make a film on your own, I would expect. <laughs> Without uh, giving away too much of uh, the nature of, of the film itself, or um, in other words, don't giving away too many spoilers, um, are you finding anything particularly notable in your conversations with the various people you've interviewed? So, I mean, I think the most notable thing is just how kind of universal the experiences talked about pretty much are in terms of the struggles to find 
and keep any type of full-time employment and the kind of statistics and um, research behind that all kind of sharing exactly the the same story in there. Are the people you're interviewing, as I mentioned, their, their uh, experiences tend to be similar in the respect that it is very difficult for uh, people of our community to get and maintain uh, employment. Um, in the people's stories that you're uh, interviewing, do they have any common features or rather do they have stories to tell that saying it is difficult for me because of this or you finding each person's story can have difficulties uh, for various reasons could you go into that aspect um i mean i think that a lot of it is a different and unique to to each individual mm -hmm. but i mean I, there are very consistent themes throughout it in terms of burnout, finding the workplace incredibly um, stressful and hard to deal with, being um, more exclusively targeted when it comes to uh, firing people or laying people off um, and kind of not having advocates for themselves within the workplace and struggling to deal with some very um, hard situations that may come up um, mm -hmm. within the workplace. But again, this is just kind of a, this is in no way, shape or form, you know, a totality of individuals' experiences either. Have you, in your interviews, found any particularly bright spots or surprises, good surprises at this point? I mean, I think the 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 best thing by and large has been people's willingness to both talk about this and to talk about uh, their their own experiences by and large being very kind of open and accommodating to bring everything up and be very kind of frank and open with this uh, by and large. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, that was uh, very enlightening material. We'll now turn it over to our cultural correspondent, Stacey Kennedy, who has a question or two. Yeah, um, my first question is, um, would you say your main expertise um, would be like doing documentaries where there's live and authentic mm -hmm. footage of people on the spectrum of their experiences with working and, and, and what kind of work or employment they would like? Um, or... Do, do you are you, do you prefer to like make movies of uh, of those about autism employment being portrayed by actually those on the spectrum or maybe not on the spectrum or do you prefer both? I mean, by and large, this is kind of the first project that I'm really doing of this nature and kind of of this scope. I've worked on other individuals' short fictional films with actors. A lot of those have been um, inclusivity based, but mostly for the LGBT community. But by and large, this is kind of the first and the largest uh, project of this nature that I have uh, worked on. What is, the pro what is the process of making a film? So it's a very long and complicated process. Um, the initial stages was even, um, say, six to eight months worth of research. Um, then I had to kind of simultaneously both find individuals who are willing to help out on the technical side um, and then find individuals who would be willing to kind of speak on camera as um, kind of both subject and subject matter experts, um, which has been about six months now of reaching out to people, finding the time to be able to um, go and film them, actually going and um, filming, which involves setting up tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment um to to get everything recorded um you know your lights your camera um microphones 
um, stands to hold everything. Um, and that involves both transporting everything there and setting it up, taking everything down and um, kind of removing it. After that, we're, there's a whole lot of storage required for this. I have four 10 terabyte hard drives that are used to store the footage and to back up the footage so that if one fails, the footage and all the work is not lost. Finally, the stage we're kind of moving into now is editing. This, we're trying to find a, an editor specifically who'd be good at working with this subject matter. We kind of pass the edit and the footage off to, which would take about between six months to, you know, up to a year to be able to edit um, all this material because we're shooting for an end of around 80 to 90 minutes. And currently we have around nine hours of footage shot all total. Um, so taking nine hours of footage and cutting it down to an hour and a half is, um, a lot of work. Once the film is edited, we'll have to take it into, um, in two different directions from there simultaneously as well. We'll have to get it kind of sound mixed, which is essentially balancing all the sound levels putting in kind of any uh, music, balancing those out, as well as getting any kind of VFX work done. This is kind of a very simple thing, say, or not not simple, but this is not kind of like putting explosions or anything on screen. Fixing up any small details in the background that would need to be kind of rotoscoped out or kind of creating uh, graphical illustrations that demonstrate certain points, creating motion graphic lower thirds that can come on and introduce individuals as they come onto screen. Finally, when that's all completed, um, we're looking at um, the way to do it from then is we have to submit the film to festivals and there's distributors essentially at festivals who are looking to essentially um, pick up a film and be able to distribute it on, you know, Netflix, Amazon, PBS, wherever. Um, so that's essentially the the ultimate end goal. Thank you again, Daniel. Will, I understand you have uh, another question for Daniel. Tell us about the people you've interviewed and, and the people you're planning to interview. Yeah, so currently I would say that by and large, the individuals that I've interviewed um, fall into kind of two or three camps. Um, there's individuals who are, say, um, on the spectrum and current or former job seekers or individuals who have had issues um, finding um, employment. There are kind of experts within the field who have done, say, a lot of uh, research, um, uh, writing and advocacy um, in this. Um, and then the third is kind of individuals working with um, people on the spectrum to be able to kind of help them um, find employment. I have interviewed both uh, Michael and Keith uh, for this project. Um, I've interviewed um, Dr. Fung at Stanford. Um, I've interviewed, um, Jan Johnson Tyler, um, forgetting what her specific organization was called, who, Evil Libre. and those are, uh, individuals all kind of more on the, the kind of expertise and kind of helping, um, side individuals. I have one current interview, um, that I have set up right now which will be the 10th interview for the project in total. There's a couple of interviews that I would still like to be able to get, but those seem to be more of a, a reach in the, in the overall project or just individuals have not followed up or been very um, forthright with their kind of availability and uh, communication. Daniel, uh, as we end up, do you have any advice for prospective filmmakers, either those who are 
on the autistic spectrum or are those who may not be on the spectrum but are interested in our community? Overly, I mean, I, I would say that the, the biggest thing is to be aware of the realities of filmmaking in terms of how much time, gear, equipment, and help something like this naturally requires. And then, in, and finally, uh, I guess to end things up, all goes well. When might our viewers and others uh, look forward to seeing your film as current week? That will partially depend on when and what we're able to find for editing and if we're able to end up getting any a lot of funding because um, money makes everything not necessarily better, but go faster. The, the estimate, I would say, is anywhere between six, seven months from now. Or, you know, it could be as long as one to two years, um, depending upon things, because we would also have to be submitting to festivals um, and potentially getting picked up there. But one thing that I am hoping to do is get, as the film is further along into, into its editing process, is kind of get um, the feedback on, say, close to final version from individuals within uh, the community on the, the final piece to, to hear feedback to see if there's any kind of changes that would be suggested, especially story-wise or things that would want to be additionally seen to make sure that it's kind of an accurate and truthful kind of representation of the community as much as possible in 90 minutes. Well, we very much look forward to uh, that release and... Uh... Okay, so um, my last question, uh, what are your preferred contact or social media that uh, we can reach you at or follow you on? Um, so I've created, uh, for social media, I've created uh, both Facebook and an Instagram page where individuals could reach out or just kind of follow the overall progress of the uh, of the documentary as it moves um, from the various stages of production. The title is work in progress, so I don't it that could change. Uh, currently on Facebook, it can be found as the employment piece, and on Instagram, it can be called employment project movie like at. I need to change that because they're not both the same. Well, thank you, Stacy, and thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Will. I'd like to tell you about the Autism Partner Handbook, How to Love an Autistic Person. This book has three co-authors, Joe Beal, Ellie Blue, who are married to each other. Joe is on the spectrum, Ellie is not. And by Dr. Faith G. Harper, a therapist. Even though this book is aimed at the partners, of autistic people. It's actually very useful for autistic people to read too. It's written in a very autistic friendly format with a lot of lists and actually I learned some things about um, the neurology of autism that I never knew. Like for instance, autistic people have about 42% more resting brain activity than most people. Our senses and our brains notice more stuff. Sometimes that's light or heat or visual detail or flavor. And yeah, so that explains many of the sensory sensitivities that many autistic people, including myself, share. And it's also full of uh, practical advice for how to how both the autistic person and the non-autistic partner can work on improving relationships. And so they talk about the uh, four things that can ruin relationships. Note that these are not unique to relationships involving autistic people. And many, many neurotypical couples face these issues too. They are criticism, contempt, defensiveness, and stonewalling. And their advice is instead of criticism, try gentle startup. Feedback and criticism are two different things. Yes, they are. 
Instead of contempt, try building a culture of appreciation. Instead of defensiveness, try taking responsibility. This is something very difficult for many people to do, especially when you feel like you're under attack. Instead of stonewalling, try physiological self-soothing. Well, again, that is easier said than done for many people and not just autistic people. I know many neurotypical people who struggle with that too. All in all, I would recommend this as a good book for autistic and non-autistic people, maybe to uh, read together and discuss how we can implement these strategies and to improve our own relationships. Thank you again. Thank you again, uh, Daniel Walker. Um, well, folks, that's this week's broadcast of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. Until next time, I'm your co-host, Cal Perrin. I'm Will Burnick. Daisy Kennedy. I'm Daniel Walker. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Stay well, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.